the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Good morning, Salem family, and good morning, friends. Welcome to Salem Bible Church's virtual service. We've always lived in times of uncertainty, for no man knows what tomorrow will bring. But we find ourselves challenged daily as we face swift transitions. Well, I'm here to tell you, there is a constant that we can depend on. For we serve the same God yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So as we prepare to enter into the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and as we usher in the Holy Spirit, I invite you to join in with us as we continue our devotion with a scripture by Deacon Mary Langley. I will sing unto the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. May my meditation be sweet to him, for I will be glad in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. I have read to you Psalms 104, verses 33 to 35. May the Lord bless the reader, hearer, and doer of his word. Now we have prayer by Deacon Inel Santos. Let us all pray. Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you for delivering us from the evils of this day. We thank you that we shall walk and not stumble, for the Holy Spirit has anointed our eyes with ourselves, and we can see clearly and has given us ears of the Spirit to hear precisely what the Holy Spirit is saying. We thank you that our angels are accompanying us on our right side and on our left. We thank you, Father God, for your presence being with us on this day. We thank you for your presence, your anointing, and your power being with us on this day. We thank you for your strong right arm, Father God, going out ahead of those who are marching for righteousness sake. We thank you, Father God, that Jesus will be with them. His blood covering will be over them. We thank you, Father God, that all people are coming together for righteousness sake. Not only black or white, Asia, all different race of people are coming together. We thank you, Father God, that even though the enemy meant it for evil, you're turning it out for good. So, Father God, we thank you that we will walk in goodness and love our neighbor as ourselves. For Jesus, you are on the side of righteousness. Father God, we thank you and we thank you for Jeremiah. Father God, he told the people to repent. He told the people to come to God. He told the people, Lord God, to be in one accord. So, Father God, we thank you that we'll be in one accord. We thank you, Father God, that the walls of Jericho is coming down. We thank you the walls, Father God, that's been governing this country is falling down. We thank you, Father God, that we will go forth and do your will as you will have it to be done. We thank you for the word that's going to be prayed on today. We thank you for the word that's going to be read on today, Lord God. We give you praise, glory, and honor for being a good God. We thank you, Father God, for blessing us and our family. We thank you for blessing our neighborhood. We thank you, Father God, for destroying coronavirus. It will fall down under Jesus' feet. For every name that is named have to fall under Jesus' feet. We thank you, Father God, that we are saved from coronavirus and any other disease to try to come against us and our family. Father God, we just thank you for your grace and your mercy, Father God, for you said your grace is sufficient for us, Lord God, your grace and mercy endures forever. Your word is established in heaven, Father God, so we're giving you praise, glory, and honor. We thank you for our church family, Father God, and we can continue to praise and worship you in the beauty of holiness. But Father God, there's only one God and one name, and that name is Jesus Christ. And we give him praise, glory, and honor. We thank you, God, for your grace and your mercy toward us on this day. It is in Jesus' name that we pray, and we all say amen. I know the Lord, he'll make a way. Yes, he will. I know the Lord, he'll make a way. Yes, he will. Although you may not have a friend, he'll go with you. Until the end 
devotion service and now we will turn it over to our pulpit. Praise God. And happy Sunday. Welcome to Salem Bible Church virtual worship experience. We are so happy to have you here with us today at the place of peace. We have two dynamic pastors, Senior Pastor Dr. Joseph L. Williams and Pastor Emeritus Jasper Williams Jr. So hey, listen, 
share this page. Let everyone know that we are here worshiping in the place of peace. Invite a friend, a coworker, a neighbor, anyone. Let them know that you're here worshiping with us today. So if this is your first time visiting, comment in the box below. Let us know where you're from. We would love to stay connected with you. So our scripture this morning comes from the book of Psalm. Psalm chapter 95, verse one, two, and three. And it reads, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the great God or the great King above all gods. Let us pray. Eternal God, we are so thankful that you are the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. God, we ask right now that you come into our place of worship, which be my homes and maybe our hotel rooms, wherever we may be, God. We ask that your presence, God, dwell in us and the place in which we dwell. God, we honor you, we honor you, we praise you, we magnify your holy and righteous name. And God, right now I ask that you bless the man of God that will give the word on today. Let it penetrate our hearts, our minds, and our spirits to do more for your kingdom and for you. These are the things we ask and pray in your name. And the people of God said, amen. Now, I know you're in your homes, but I ask that you give God a hand clap of praise and let him know that we love him and he is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We are now ready for our Salem News. Hello, you're watching WSBC Salem News, your source for news and information in and around Salem Bible Church. I'm Shata Spikes and here's a look at your church news. SBC has partnered with DeKalb County to offer free COVID-19 testing. It will take place Monday through Friday at our Stonecrest location, located at 5460 Hillendale Drive. The testing will be from 10 a.m. until 3 p.m. There's no cost and no registration. Our SBC Social Services Ministry Food Pantry will be closed this week at both locations. Both locations will reopen on Tuesday, July 7th. There will be a fresh mobile delivery at our Stonecrest location on Tuesday. There will be a fresh mobile delivery at our Atlanta location on Thursday. Also, it's important to note that until further notice, no clothing donations will be accepted at our social services ministry. As you know, COVID-19 has changed the way we do church, but that won't stop us from fellowship and from edifying our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So make sure you sign up for our 12 tribe small groups. To sign up, just visit our website, SalemBibleChurch.org. Click on the 12 tribe small group banner and get involved. Just this Wednesday, you'll be able to participate. Also, make sure you join us for Bible study with our senior pastor. It takes place on Wednesdays at 12 noon on Facebook. Just go to Salem Bible Ministries and join us. Our church offices will remain closed to the public until further notice. However, if you need assistance, you can call on Tuesdays from 9 a.m. until 1 p.m. All emergency pastoral care situations can be reported to our after hours line. It's 404-304-3218. For any updates regarding Salem Bible Church, just visit our website, salembiblechurch.org and follow us on social media at Salem Bible Ministries. No Racial tension and social injustice is plaguing our nation. You can put your feet to the pavement for justice. Join the 100 million steps for justice movement. 10,000 people making 10,000 steps in a virtual run walk beginning June 19th through July 3rd. We make a change that don't just last a week. It lasts for a lifetime. For a lifetime. Juneteenth is our official kickoff day in that it commemorates the newfound freedom of slaves in 1865, two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation. Register now at 100msteps.org. 100msteps.org. Make a small donation of $15. The goal is to raise $150,000 to finance the fight for justice. 100% of the proceeds will be donated to social justice groups like the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, Black Lives Matter, Color of Change, Man Up Community, Black Girls 
Sales Code and Next Level Boys Academy. Your part is simple and significant. Register online at 100msteps.org. Follow on Facebook at 100 Million Steps. Let's win together. At Salem Bible Church, we have multiple ways to give. You can give by mailing in your tithes and offering to Salem Bible Church, 2283 Baker Road, Northwest Atlanta, Georgia, 30318. You can also give by going to our website, salembiblechurch.org. Click on the online giving link. Fill in the necessary information and please remember to wait for your confirmation number. We have a new way to give. You can give by going to the Apple Store or Google Play and download the Givelify app. Fill in the information and you can give from your phone. You can also text to give. Text your amount to 404-495-5081. Well, this has been your edition of Salem News. I'm Shata Spikes and I'll see you again next week. Shalom. Wash those hands. Bye-bye. Good morning, Salem. I'm so happy to be with you again. I must say that I had thought we would be together as a congregation in both of our locations prior to now, but it does not look as though we can any of us know just when it's going to be. And so I understand that. I want to say, however, to you personally, from the pulpit to you as the pew in your house, that I really miss being with you. Um, it's difficult times for us as a congregation, but more so, it's a difficult time for our nation as well as our world. But be that as it may, one thing we know about it all is that God is in charge. And so we're going to readjust ourselves and we're going to be patient. We're going to wait. You're not going to allow the depression of being cooped up and can't move about and be sociable beings as all of us are accustomed because we are human. We're just going to readjust, reset, and move on. Okay? Now, I want to say a couple of things. We're coming up now on the second Sunday in August will be the Sunday that I shall have been privileged to preach the gospel for 70 years. That sounds shocking to you, but believe me, it is more shocking to me than it is to you. I had no idea 50, 60, 40 years ago that God would privilege me to reach this milestone. But for whatever reasons he has, I'm here. And I thank God I'm still able to be on my feet and I'm still able to whatever degree to share and preach his word. In the times that we have been out of our congregation, away from our sanctuaries, I have been privileged to have working in and for us our media department. And believe me, they have stepped up to the plate over, above, and beyond the call of duty. They've been the musicians, they've been the deacon, the elder, they've done everything that needs to be done. First, it has been led by he who is in charge of our media department in our church. He's been with me now 30 plus. We were teasing a little a few days ago about his almost 40 years, but uh, Elder Philander Boyd has been with me a long time. He, of course, is the chairperson of our media department. I want to say a big thanks to him because he does much of the grunt work in corralling and organizing what it is that we do and how we do it going forward. And then there is Sister April Cooper. April is the person who does all the slides for us and she has done a super fantastic job. I want to say thanks to her. And then right behind her is Cameron Jemison. He's a young man who was born in this church, one of our fine praise and worship leaders. We don't have one any better than Cameron is. He heads for us our social media department, working alongside our first lady as well, Sister Lynette Williams, my son Joseph's wife. God bless Cameron and we thank him very much. And then there is also Stan Booker, who is one of our fine cameramen. He uh, is a person that we can count on. He's always arisen to the occasion. A big thanks to Stan. And then last but not least, there is also Rod Moore, a fine young man. He has an excellent family. He and his lovely wife have been with us a good while. 
So I just wanted to start off today by giving a big thanks to these who have made it possible for us to be able to come to you each week by transcription as we have, by stream as we have. God bless them and I thank them from the innermost and depths of my heart and I thank you as a congregation for the way that you sweet people have responded. Now with those things having been said, I want you today to take your Bibles, if you will, and turn them to the book of Haggai. Haggai is toward the end of the Old Testament. You have Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi in that order. The book of Haggai, it only has two chapters, but I want to cue in on something today that I think is at the very basis and the rock foundation of our Christendom and where we are as a church and what we as a Christian must do and how we must do it and how we must be about it. My subject for today is understanding the principle of God first. Understanding the principle of God first. That's our subject, Haggai chapter 1. Bringing your minds in now and think about back in the history of Israel, having become one of the great nations of the world. When Solomon died, the nation of Israel was divided into two great distinct kingdoms. That was the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. The Northern Kingdom was comprised of 10 tribes and the Southern Kingdom was comprised of two tribes. The northern kingdom was quickly destroyed by the Assyrian Empire and then some few years went by and King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon went and seized the city of Jerusalem. But he did it by taking and robbing from the city of Jerusalem its best and most productive minds. In other words, he took out of Jerusalem the best doctors, the best lawyers, the best soothsayers, mathematicians, the best scientists, the best philosophers. And when he got the best of the Jews, he marched them from the hills of Judea all the way down to the lowlands of Babylon. And they stayed in captivity for 70 years. And it was only after the king of Persia, who was King Cyrus, when he overthrew the Babylonian Empire, one of the very first executive orders that he issued was called the Edict of Cyrus. And in the Edict of Cyrus, he signed a decree stating that all the Jews would be free, that no longer would they be held in captivity, that they were free to go back to their homelands and proceed their lives as they were doing prior to their captivity. And so here they are now, back in Jerusalem. And when they came back to Jerusalem, they found that the city of Jerusalem had been ravished and was laying in ruin and in rubbish. They found that their women had been molested, their children had been slain. The towers of Jerusalem had fallen. The gates of the city had been wrung from its hinges. And God's house, God's house, the temple had been burned. And the temple, the house of God, laid in total devastation right there in Jerusalem. They had been back now from captivity for about 16 years had gone by. They were back in their homeland. And it is at that time, in the year of 520 BC, that God calls the prophet Haggai and tells him to preach and to prophesy to his people. And it comes up here, and we pick it up in Haggai chapter 1, verse 2. Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, The people says the time has not come the time that the Lord's house should be built. In other words, the people were saying 
it's not time. Uh, Haggai was preaching and telling them sermon after sermon. He would preach and prophesy. It's time now to rebuild God's house. And every time he would prophesy, it's time to rebuild God's house. The people would respond. It is not time for us to build God's house. It is not time for us to build God's house. It is not time. And so during this, what you call post-exilic era, they had raised uh, the issues. God was saying, I'm calling you here, guy. Go back again and tell them it is time to rebuild my house. And they will come back again saying, it is not time. It is not time. It is not time. Verse 3. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and the temple to lie in ruins? So in verse 2, the people are saying, Lord, it is not time. It is not time. It is not time, Haggai. It is not time to rebuild God's house. But in verses 3 and 4, the Lord is telling Haggai, Haggai, you go check out, see what they're doing with their time. They're claiming that they don't have time to build my house, but I go home with them every evening and I know the kinds of modern day conveniences that they have put themselves in. I know what's going on. When I trail and follow them home, I see that they are not living in no shacks. They're not living in run-down houses. They are not street people. They are not living as though they are homeless, but these people have paneled houses. The original King James Version calls it ceiling houses. It translates in this 21st century that they had all of the modern day things at their disposals that they could have. It's like saying that they had trash mashers and they had garbage disposals. They had microwaves. They had big flat screen TVs. Everything was modernized and was convenient for their living. They had everything they wanted at their disposals. So Haggai, what they're really saying is not that they don't have time. What they're really saying is that they don't have time for me. And let's look at it, ladies and gentlemen. When we look at our situations, it has been centuries now since this text was written, but this is the same problem that we have today in this 21st century. It's not that we don't have time. <laughs> we got plenty of time. We just don't take the time to reprioritize our lives as we ought to prioritize. I mean, we got the time, but not the time to prioritize. Somewhere along the way, when we talk about ourselves and realizing the, prop the problem of prioritizing, I mean, somehow our priorities have gotten all mixed up. Our priorities have become values that have strayed out of order. For whatever the reasons, we tend to consistently major in our minors, and we minor in our majors, you know. We have a tendency to take our primary imperatives and make them become our secondary options. We have a real bad habit of, of putting emphasis on that which ought to be last first, and that which ought to be first, we put it last. And so this is the problem that these people were experiencing in the days of Haggai. And so because they had put themselves, listen, first, put themselves first, and they had put me, God, last, since they have done that, Haggai, you tell them this, verse 6, you have sown much and bring in little. You eat but you do not have enough to eat. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. 
And he who earn wages, earn wages to put into a bag with holes in it. Unfortunately, this is right where we are still today in this 21st century. I mean, when God is not first, Everything about our lifestyles happens as though we too got holes in our pockets. And so when you got a hole in your pocket, you can go on and live life however you want. You can put yourselves in the finest and best of houses. You can drive the nicest automobiles. You can wear the latest fashions, the styles, and designs, but when God puts a hole in your sack, nothing, absolutely nothing can stitch it up because God has cut a hole in your pocket. And so in this day of Haggai, the people had prioritized fixing their own houses first while God's house had needs and it's it lay there with needs unattended. They had fixed their house first, while God's house had not even had the foundation laid. And so 16 years has gone by since they have been released and privileged to be back home. And here they are mistakenly placing God, listen, on the back burner of their lives. Lord have mercy, on the back burner. Yes, you're in church today, and I'm glad about that, but my question is, where is God in your life? The question really arises, ladies and gentlemen, is where is God in terms of being on the altar of your life? Let me break it on down to really simple talk to you. Just one little question. As it relates to your life, don't answer it out loud, but just to your inner selves. Is God first? Is God first? That's my question. Is God first? Three things I want to lift out of this thought on today, and hopefully it will bring you to a different focus about how to change your life to where it impacts your being to give you the kind of escalation and the rising and change in the rise that you ought to experience. First, I want you to see the meaning of God being first. Just what does it mean to say that God is first in my life? Secondly, I want you to see the messages of God being first. There are some messages that reverberates and kicks right back in our faces to where we can't do anything but look at it eyeball to eyeball. And these messages are very clear in giving us distinctions and understandings about the principle of putting God first. And then last of all, I want you to see the marvel of God being first. What do I mean? I want you to see how when you change the spectrum of your life and move it from self-concerns to God's concerns, how it changes and enhances your life to move you still to another dimension, to another level, to another upward moving. Those are the three points that I want to bring, the meaning, the message and the marvel of God being first. Roman numeral one, the meaning of God first. Just what does it mean to put God first? Let me start by saying <clears throat> that God is not interested in being your number two. Never ever. Bring it on down. God is not wanting to be your part-time love. God is not in part-time God-ding. He, he's a first and only God in all of our lives. And he seeks first 
and the godly place that he ought have in our lives. I'm reminded of the time when the scribes and the Pharisees came to Jesus while here on earth and they came running, Jesus, which is the greatest commandment in all of the law? And Jesus gave them the answer to that in Matthew's gospel, chapter 22, verses 37 and 38. Jesus said to them, listen, he says to them, you are to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And then in the 38th verse, he says, this is the first great commandment. And then he goes on to talk about the second commandment is to love thy neighbor as thyself. But back to this first commandment, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. God is saying here that he wants to be first in your heart. He wants to be first in your soul. He wants to be first in your mind. Now, when he says, I want to be first, love me with all your heart, he's talking about your affections. It is in your heart that your affections flows and goes. And so God is saying, as it relates to your heart, as it relates to your affections, I want to be and I must be your first love. That's what he's talking about. And then he says, love the Lord thy God with all thy soul. What is he talking about when he says, love God with your soul? He's talking about loving God with your personality. You have a certain persona a certain you, your soul is your quintessence. The soul is the quintessence of your essence. It's the you underneath the skin. And God is saying that part of you must be able to enter and exchange and receive me as your foremost. Love me with all your soul. And then he says at the end, with all thy mind, that means your thought processes, your first thoughts, your thinkings are to be enveloped, engulfed, and surrounded by me first. That's what he's saying. And so when God stops being first in your life, that's when the problem starts for your life. Never wants to be second place. Put it like this, God does not want to be your Avis, which is the second best car rental agency <clears throat> in our world. God wants to be your Hertz. What is that? That's the number one in the car rental services of our world. And so when you put God first by obeying his principles, and you put God first by following his divinely established patterns, your life becomes aligned then with the plans and the purposes that God tends to carry out with his universe, see? And when you don't put God first and you allow the, the worries of life and the clutters of things in life to <clears throat> clog up everything that is in your life. You throw your lives out of balance. Life becomes off tilted. Life really becomes what you might call out of whack. That's what happens. When we step out of God's perfect plan, we get tilted. We get off balance. When he is not in first place, our lives become maladjusted so to speak. That's what he's really saying here. When you fail to do that, when you fail for the spiritual part of your being to not be connected with he who is that spirit, it spills over then into every other arena and area of your being and most especially of your life. Through the truths of God being first, listen, God demands it because he is your creator. He is your sustainer. 
He is your king, your savior. God is your source. Now, what do I mean when I say God is your source? I mean that everything about your life, God is at the root of it. I don't care how successful your business is, how good you're doing with your career, how well things are going on your job and your promotions. You can say, I got this and, 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 and I had the intelligence and the wherewithal to achieve this, to achieve that. That makes no never mind about all of that. When you get through with it, when you get through boasting and bragging about what you did for you, at the bottom of it all is God. Let me prove that to you. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, Verses 17 and 18, it says just that. Verse 17 talks about how I got all my wealth. And verse 18 talks about how God is the one who did it and not you. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 17. It says, and thou say in thine heart, listen, my power and the might of mine hand had gotten me this wealth. See, I, my, and my, I did this. That's verse 17. But look at what verse 18 says. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. Why? For it is he, who is that? For it is God that does what? That giveth the power to get wealth that he, that who, that God, that God may what? Establish what? His covenant, which he, God, swore unto the Father as it is to this day. And so you can make all the money in the world. You can live in the best house. You can drive the nicest car. But it will all be of no bearing. It will be of no never mind at all. Because when God cuts a hole in your sack, when God puts a hole in your pocket, it will just be as though you never had it. So the issue here with these people back in Haggai's day was an issue of not having enough time. It was an issue of not prioritizing the time that they had. It was the issue of having placed God on the back burner of their lives. So point one, the meaning of God being first is just that. God first is just that. God wants to be first is just that. God must be first is just that. God demands to be first. It's just that. God is first. Secondly now, what is the message of God being first? It is in this part of the text that the giving of the first fruits helps us to explain the messages that reverberate in God being first. Because according to the word of God, whenever you give God first fruits, you not only give him the first, but when you give the first fruits, you also give him the best. See, So the message of first fruits is that God must be the recipient of the first and of the best. Get that now. Your first and your best. These days of Haggai that we have lifted here uh, were days that were very much like the last two prophets of the Old Testament. Remember, I told you at the beginning that the three prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, prophesied and preached pretty much at the same time spans that all of them were living in. 
They were living in times of preachers and as prophets whereby the people were giving God the leftovers of their lives. That's what they were doing. They were also not just giving God leftovers, <laughs> but they were bringing God, listen, the worst of the leftovers. When time to worship God with their giving, they brought blind cows, they brought lean heifers and bullocks, they brought sick pigeons and doves, they put unhealthy sheep and goats on the altar. And even though they had picked over the leftovers and had intentionally opt to give God the worst of the leftovers, when they did give and lay it on the altar, they went away shouting as though they had laid their all on the altar. They would pass over all of the good stuff to just give God the worst that they had. But here's the thing, God does not want the basement of your life. God wants the main floor. God is interested in the creme de la creme of you, see? He doesn't want the basement, he wants the prime cut of your life. Nothing more, nothing else, nothing less than your best, your best. That's what he wants. He talks about it all through the scriptures. Let me just share two or three of them with you. In Exodus chapter 23 and verse 19, God says, bring the choice fruits. In Numbers chapter 18, verse 13, God says, bring the ripe fruit. In Leviticus chapter 22, verses 17 through 25, God says, bring the best of your flock, watch. And if there are defects, then don't bring it. In other words, if you're gonna bring God the least and worst you got, he's saying here, don't bring it. At the front door of the Bible, which is the book of Genesis, there's a unique story that I must pause and share with you right here and hopefully you will vividly be able to see what it is that I'm talking about the messaging in terms of God being first and God also being the recipient of your best in the fourth chapter of the book of Genesis we have the story of Cain and Abel in the first four verses there are unique parallels that I would like to lift hopefully to articulate and make plain this point. Verse one, now Adam knew his wife. When it says knew his wife, it means he had sex with his wife. And she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Verse two, then she bore again. This time his brother Abel was a keeper of sheep but Cain was a tiller of the ground, verse three. But in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering, and Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. The problem, what is the problem? I mean, why is it that Abel's offering was so favorably accepted and yet Cain's offering was so harshly denied? That's the question. I mean, both of them gave the works of their hands there's nowhere in here that Cain gave God Abel's sheep. There's no inference here that Abel gave God Cain's vegetables. Because when it comes down to what you should give to God, the first thing that we must come to the realization of 
is that we can only give that which comes through and from our own hands, see. Only that which comes as a result of what we have produced can you give to God. God will never ever require us to give to him what it is that we do not have. Can't do that. God does expect us to do our best when it comes down to giving that which comes from our own productivity, that which comes from our own hands. You cannot give sheep if all you've done is raise corn. You cannot give corn if all you have done is raise sheep. And so the Lord does not expect you to do that. The Lord does expect you, however, to give a decent offering of the first that you have. He does expect that. He does expect that your offering that you give comes as a result of what you have achieved with your own hands. And so Abel's offering was received by God, while Cain's offering was denied by God. And the question arises, why was that? There's one school of thought which suggests that Abel uh, gave God the best offering, and the reason why God accepted his offering was because he gave an offering of blood, an offering that could shed blood. He gave a sheep, whereas Cain gave vegetables. The Bible says he gave the fruit of the ground, which is vegetables. And since you can't get blood out of a turnip, that's the reason why he accepted Abel's offering, sheep blood, and denied Cain's offering, which was nothing but a vegetable and no blood was in it. That's what one school of thought teaches us about that. But I've got to disagree with that. That can't be the reason at all because if God judged it like that, then he is exercising a prejudice. There's a bigotry that God is exemplifying because he's misjudging Cain. How can Cain bring what he does not have? Cain did not have sheep. Cain did not have any animals that could shed blood. And so God would not be unfair to expect of him blood when he had only vegetables. See, that way God would be an unjust God. So then why, again, why does God accept Abel's offering and then rejects Cain's offering? That's the question. In order to see and get the answer, come back now to this same text, these same verses. Verses 4 and verse 3 gives us, I think, the reasoning as to why Abel's offering is accepted and Cain's offering is rejected. Look at it with me in verse 4. Abel brought, that is, the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. That's what it says. The original King James Version puts it like this, that Abel brought the firstlings of his flock. That means he gave God the first and of the fat thereof, that means he gave God the best, see? It says that nowhere in here, when you read about what Cain brought, that he gave the first fruits of the ground, nor that he gave the best vegetables of, best first fruits of the ground. He didn't give God the first of anything. Cain didn't, he didn't do that. Cain gave an offering, but it was an offering without any kind of sacrifice. He gave an offering without making any kind of real effort. See, Cain gave an offering begrudgingly without 
no generosity expressed. He gave with an attitude and not out of gratitude. Cain gave from his hand and not from his heart, see? But Abel, Abel's offering involved sacrifice. It involved commitment. It involved generosity and a real sense of caring and sharing. Abel's offering involved taking time to make sure that I'm honoring God with my first and then the best of my first. He took time to give God the firstling. He gave God that which was pleasing and that which looked good to him. He didn't give God the leftovers. Abel brought the firstborn of his flock. <laughs> Abel brought the fat of the firstlings. In other words, he brought the sheep that had the stockiest, that was the beefest, the sheepest, the sheep that had the greatest and the strongest constitution, he brought God his best. But why? Why did Abel do that? Why did Abel give God the first and the best of the first? Simple answer. Simply because he believed in his heart that God deserved that. That's what he believed. He believed God deserved the first of what he had and that God deserved the best of the first that he had. You say, what did Cain believe? I'm so glad you asked. Cain believed that God deserved, let me see how do I put this. Cain believed that God deserved, let me see. Abel believed that God deserved the first and then the best of the first. Cain believed that God deserved some. That's what I want to say, some. <laughs> he didn't even believe God deserved the whole word, something. He just believed God deserved some. Kind of like many of you, you think all God deserves is some. I mean, do you really know who God is? Do you really come to the realization of understanding what he who brought us all into existence, who he really is? And, and all you think he deserves is some? Cain brought God something, you know, that's just, just some. And God says, offering denied. Abel brought God the first and the best of the first. And God says, offering acceptable. I dare you just give God some. When he spoke and out of chaos came this cosmos that we are in the midst of. When he spoke, he rolled this terrestrial ball into space and baptized it with a liquid mist, ordered a variety of blooming flowers, transfigured into a marvelous attraction. I dare you give him some. It's got to be a real recognition of who God really is. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I must admit to you that I have a degree of mm, worship for who you wouldn't think I worship. I tell you that I worship this entity that I'm about to tell you about because I do go through all of the formalities. I go through all of the celebrative things that you do to worship anything or anybody and I'll tell you I'll admit to you who I worship 
and how I go about worshiping them. <laughs> and you know them. I'm sure you're familiar with the Atlanta Falcons. I mean, <laughs> they are my team. I love the Atlanta Falcons. I really do. And I worship them. Because if they have a four o'clock game on a Sunday afternoon, and it doesn't look like we're going to have, well, the season is still questionable as to whether we're going to have a football season this year or not. I don't really know whether that's going to come into a reality. I really hope we do. But, but the point that I'm making is that if that is a four o'clock game, um, I know that the Falcons football game is going to be between four o'clock and seven o'clock. And so I do everything I can to get home from church before four o'clock and I get myself in place because I don't want nobody and nothing to be calling on my time uh, between four o'clock and seven o'clock. If you got something you want me to do, you tell me about it, let me do it before four o'clock or I can do it after seven o'clock, but nowhere between four o'clock and seven o'clock can you bother me because I am in what I personally call my Atlanta Falcons church service at that time. That's, that's what I'm doing, pure and simple as that. And it's like church for me because I got my own special pew I sit in, you know. I got a certain chair I like to be in when I watch the Falcons play. And my altar is my big flat screen TV. I, I, I want to see the Falcons. I don't want to be distracted. And I'm going to watch that game. You say, how long? For three whole hours. And I don't care how long they play. Three whole hours. Even if there is overtime. I don't, I don't uh, complain about overtime. When it gets tied up and they got to go into overtime, I'm not looking at my watch and trying to see what time it is and that it's three hours plus and the Falcons playing too long and I don't put my finger up and like I ease out like we do, you know. I, I, I don't do that when the Falcons are playing because this is God's team to me on the football field. I give it everything I got. And I'll tell you what else, when, when the game gets tied up, if the Falcons um, score a touchdown, oh, you know how they go through the, the, the rigmarole of celebrating in the end zone. I find myself doing their dance in the end zone and jumping up shouting and glad because they, they made a touchdown. And then when they fumble the ball, you know, like they did some several years ago when they were in the Super Bowl, had the Super Bowl won, and they fumble the ball at the end, and the New England Patriots won the game. And you, you, you know, I, I, I got mad and I got sad. And you say, why? Because when they do well, I celebrate. And when they do bad, I hurt and I get mad and I get sad because their joy is my joy because their pain is my pain. That's what you call worship to a degree. But let me show you what degree it is that the worship tree changes when it comes down to the Falcons and God. Because I have to ask myself one question about my falcon worship tree, and that is this. What has Matt Ryan done for me lately? Hmm? What has he done? I mean, what has that good wide-end receiver, Julio Jones, what has Julio done for me lately? What has Todd Gurley, the running back, done for me lately. But God got me up this morning. God started me on my way today. God brought me to this house to preach to you online today. God has given me everything that he can give me for today and for my life and going forward. Some of you right now, 
pushed him on the back burner because tonight, tonight, you're going to bed at 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, no later than 10 o'clock tonight. Why? Because you got to get up early in the morning and go to work. But last night, you didn't go to bed until 12, maybe 1 o'clock. Why? Because all I got to do is get up and go get online and watch church in the morning. See? Watch church in the morning. But I deserve, I deserve to give God what he deserves, which is my best. My best. It is because God deserves our recognition of him first. And because he deserves our best, that he challenges us right here in his word to give him the tithe and to give him the offering. This is God's way of establishing ownership. When you give God the tithe and the offering of your life, you're saying to God, you own me, Lord. You are in charge of me, God. That's what you're saying. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 23 says that you are to give the tenth that you might learn to fear the Lord. See, uh, what does that mean? That's not, that doesn't mean that you give the tithe and the offering so that you learn to be afraid of God or you learn to be scared of God. But I give the tithe and offering so that I learn to fear God in terms of having a respect for God. See, that's what it means. To have a reverence for who God is. To have a holy awe recognition of him being in charge of my life. That's what you're really saying. Whenever you give your tithes and your offerings, you're honoring God as God. When you give your tithes and your offerings, what you're really saying to God is, God, I belong to you. That's what the giving of the tithe and the offering is. God, I belong to you. Your giving the tithe and offering is like your wedding ring. See, when you put on your man's red and wedding ring and he puts on your wedding ring that means the man is saying when they look at the ring on his finger i belong to sue i belong to barbara i belong to dorothy and when you wear his wedding ring lady you're saying i belong to john i belong to bill i belong to bob see it's a matter of showing that I belong to my man, I belong to my woman. And when we give the tithe and the offering, we're saying like wearing God's wedding band, Lord, I belong to you. So the giving of the tithe and the offering is an indicator of do you value God first? That's the issue. God had to be first, that's A. God had to be given the best, that's B. But C is the mechanism and the source through which you recognize him first and give him the best was through the giving of the tithes and the offering. This was God's way for the worshiper to give to God because of what God had given them. Let me show you now scripturally what the Bible says. In Deuteronomy chapter 26, listen to what they were doing. They, they were giving God the first fruits as well. Watch. Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 1, it says, And it shall be when thou art come in unto the land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee. See, God had been good. Verse 3, I profess this day unto the Lord thy God that I am come unto the country which the Lord swear unto our fathers for to give us. See, verse 9, and he had brought us 
into this place and hath, that is, given us this land. Verse 10, and now I behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land which thou, O Lord, hast given me. The giving of the first fruits was, was a celebrated way of doing for God for what all God had done for them. The first fruits was an opportunity for the worshiper to give over and above the regular tithe and offering. That's why they did it. They did it once a year. Let me see if I can explain the first fruits. Once a year at harvest time, they gave the, the first fruit offering. Let's say, for example, you had a 10-acre part of land. Uh, God would say, this first part is mine, and you got access to the other nine acres. They're yours. But you do by those nine of yours, and, and do by mine what you do with thine. In other words, break up the fallow ground on your nine, and break up the fallow ground on my one. Plant the seeds on yours and plant the seeds on my one. Cultivate yours, cultivate mine, raise yours, raise mine. Do what you need to do for yours and do the same thing for mine. See, And when, when harvest time comes, gather it up, but don't you touch mine. You gather it up Bind it up, put it on an ox cart, and bring it to my house and give to me God. But here was the problem, because the question was always this. What if we have bad weather? What if the hurricane comes and destroys? All of my nine. What if something out of the ordinary comes and I lose everything I got? What then? Well, that's the point. The giving of first fruits demanded F A I T H faith. Forsaken all I trust him that no matter what happens, I trust God. But again, now, think about what you're saying. If something happened, something I didn't expect out of the ordinary, there come a hurricane, bad weather, something that just takes away everything I got. There again, that's where your faith comes in again because four words kick in. Even if I give God his part, and I lose the other nine acres that I got because of my faith, four words describes what I know then. And you know what that is? God got my back. God got my back. Ladies and gentlemen, I've decided that I'm going to take my chances on God. Because when you take your chances on God, you don't need no casino. When you take your chances on God, you don't need no luck. Mm -mm. When you take your chances on God, you don't need to be worrying about, am I going to get 21 when I play blackjack? No. You don't have to worry about, I got this wheel here and I'm going to roll this marble here and it's going to hit on black or, or red and I'm going to be able to pick the number. You don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about when I throw the crap, I'm going to hit 7 or 11 or and if I don't, I'm going to make my point. You don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about sitting in the poker room trying to get pairs or trying to get three of a kind or a straight or a flush. You don't have to worry about that. Oh, you don't have to worry about that. I got God, and I don't need nobody else. The final message now of the first fruit says to God, 
Lord, you are worthy. Lord, you are worthy. Actually, that's the definition of worship. Worth-ship. Worthy, thou art worthy, O Lord. You see, when you give, and I've seen it happen so many times in our church, going on 57 years now, I've watched that when time comes for us to give, no matter how high the spirit is, it comes down when it says it's time to give our tithes and our offering. The spirit comes down because you're looking at giving in the church as a time saying, well, you know, Rev preached pretty good today, so I'm going to give another two, three dollars, five dollars more. Or the choir sang pretty good, and so I'm going to give a, hey, giving in God's house is about worshiping and completing and fulfilling your worship tree in God's house. That's what it is. Let me show you in the Bible what it says about worshiping in giving. In Psalm chapter 96, verse 8, listen to what the word of God says. Give unto the Lord the glory do his name. Well, how do I do that? Bring an offering and come into his courts. I thought you said it's about worship. Verse 9, oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. It's about worshiping God, giving to God, giving him the tithe, giving him the offering. If I choose giving a first fruit once a year, doing that because I'm worshiping God. And you do know what worship is, don't you? Worship is the celebration of God for who he is and for what he has done in your life. That's worship. And he is the celebrity that deserves worship tree. The celebrity, yes. God is the celebrity of the universe and he deserves our worship. You know, in Hollywood, I'm just about through. In Hollywood, there is this um, Chinese theater that is called the Chinese squares, and it is in this theater that more than 200 stars through the years have gone to this place, and they have put their handprints in the mud, and then they put their footprints in the mud. Marilyn Monroe did it, and, and Jane Weinman did it, and Clark Gable when he lived, and Humphrey Bogart, and Madonna, Denzel, all of them put their hands, the print of their hands, and the shape and print of their feet in the mud to establish one fact, and that is Marilyn Monroe has been here. Clark Gable has been here. Denzel Washington has, has been here. But there's another celebrity. You know who he is. He established with his hands and with his feet his being a celebrity because he went to that hill called Calvary as he traveled the Via Della Rosa and with his hands being nailed and with his feet being spiked. He did it with you in mind, with you in mind. Worship tree is about how good God has been to you. Closing now, there's the marvel of God being first. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, says the Lord of hosts. And see, will I, listen, open the windows of heaven. Let me stop right there. Open the windows of heaven. God does not promise if you give tithes and offerings that you're going to be rich. God does not promise if you give tithes and offerings that you're going to have a big, fine, bad house. God does not promise if you give tithes and offerings that you're going to have 
a real nice car that you're going to live in Buckhead. None of that is what he promises when you give tithes and offerings. What God does promise when we give our tithes and we give our offerings, he promises that you will live under an opened heaven. Did you hear me? An opened heaven. Part of the reason why you got money in the bank and you got a nice car and a, and a pretty house and you got all of that, but you're miserable. You're more miserable now than you've ever been in your life. And that's because you've been living under a closed heaven. God says, when you give me the tithe and the offering, I put you then under an opened heaven. And when the heavens are open, you can receive, receive blessings that you knew not of. Thank you, Lord. I'm where I am because of what God has done. What's the claim to your fame? Is the claim to your fame the deeds to your house? Is the claim to your fame the title to your car? No, my claim to fame is what the Lord has done for me. I'm coming up now, ladies and gentlemen, to 70 years of preaching. 70 years of preaching. When I had preached for 50 years, the preachers who came to celebrate it at that time were saying that they were surprised I wasn't bent over and that I was still able to stand and walk and preach at 50 years of preaching? And then 60 years, they, they were shocked and surprised. And here I am coming up now to 70 years of preaching the gospel, preaching the gospel for 70 years, ladies and gentlemen. That means that I have preached, and not because I, but God has allowed me to preach. The whole half of the 20th century and the first fifth of the 21st century. Somebody said, I need to be in the Guinness book. Well, if you're going to put me in the Guinness book, put me in there not because of what I did. Because my claim to fame is what God has done. God called me to preach. Before my mother and my daddy ever met, he like stilled and held me in glory until five years had gone by after my dad met my mama. And then one day when old man Jasper and Alice got together at 858 Hamilton Street, God said, here is a highway I need to put this soul on that I'm going to guide his life through the ups and the downs, through the rights and the wrongs, through the goods and the bad. Fix his soul. That I'll be his claim to fame when he preaches for 70 years. What's your claim to fame? Hmm? What is it that God has done in your life? Hmm? What is it about your life that you owe God being first? You owe God the best of the first. You owe God showing him that he owns you by giving him the tithes and the offerings. See, what is your claim to fame? I'm through now. And I'm closing with the last four words, it's been the Lord. <laughs> it's been the Lord. See, that's what it's been. I came here just like God had a road map laid out for me, and all I had to do was travel it. When I got to be 17 years old, time to come to Atlanta. Didn't know nobody. And the week before I started at Mo House, my daddy accidentally, by coincidence, sat down beside in the National Baptist Convention the Reverend Dr. B. Joseph Johnson, who pastored Greater Mount Calvary Baptist Church here in Atlanta, Georgia. 
He says to him, I'm Reverend J.W. Williams from Memphis. He says, I'm Reverend B. Joseph Johnson from Atlanta. Oh, I got a son coming to Atlanta. He's there now registering for Mohouse. Well, give him my phone number and tell him to call me and I'll go pick him up. I said coincidence, not by coincidence did they meet, but by divine providence they met because God had that destined to happen for me and for my life. And he has the same thing designed for you and your life. If you give him what's his, if you acknowledge like I am acknowledging the success I've had has been the Lord the success I've been able to come to has been the Lord. If I have any more success, it'll be the Lord. Bow your heads in prayer, if you will. All wise, everlasting God, thank you, Lord, for your word today. Thank you for these people who have made special sacrifices to come and to help this church to be moved and to go over, above, and beyond the call of duty. Thank you for these who watch every Sunday. Thank you for using me as a, as a shield and as a protector and as a person that can guide them through far and of their lives. Give us the kind of peace, Lord, they're locking our country down. They're locking our state down. They're locking our city down. Looks like we're going to be locked down for a while longer. I pray for the peace that surpasses all understanding be granted unto they who watch on Sundays and on Wednesdays and that you keep us in your perfect peace. And we'll give you and yours the first and the best of the first, in your name we pray, amen, 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 Lord. God bless you. Good morning, Salem. I pray that this message that you've just heard is something that you've received, that has met you exactly where you are. What I'm about to say is something that's in a different tone and tenor than what we've done before. But I want you to understand before we get there, if you are a person that you're looking to establish a relationship with Jesus Christ, or if you need prayer in your life, if you're either of those two types of individuals, we wanna hear from you. There are people right here who are willing, able, and desire to take you through the necessary steps of salvation to establish a relationship with Christ, as well as there are people who are willing to pray with you. If that is you, if you're a person that you're in need of salvation or prayer, we want, you, we want to hear from you. Reach out to us at social media at SalemBibleChurch.org. Again, that's social media at SalemBibleChurch.org. To all of you who are viewing and watching this, I want you to listen very, very closely because we are in a time like we've never seen before. Um, we're in a time, ladies and gentlemen, whereby the purpose of the existence of the church and the uh, M.O. of the church, the purpose of the church, we're going to see the manifestation of that different now like never before. We're no longer in, in a time where the local church, church's number one mission is just to worship or to expand or to grow. All of those things are great. But right now, the church, this country and this world is in a state of survival. What does that mean? It means that the purpose of the local church in the times that we're living in is going to be in a position to where it is assisting people with what they need to survive these dark times. If a church is not doing that, its doors do not need to be open. Every church that is standing no matter how big, no matter how small it is, needs to be in existence to help people survive throughout these times. Now, when you look at the breakdown of that, people need financial help more than ever. 
here at our social services department on both sides, I've seen and we've seen lines that are literally wrapped around the church every Tuesday and Thursday. When I was here just the other day, I saw a pastor, of course, I won't call his name, who came to the church, who needed food because the doors of his church have closed down. His family had nothing to eat and coming to our church was the only other uh, option that he had to keep food on the table. There's so many people who have degrees, who have gone to school, who have been doing well and have nothing. The church has to be there to help these types of individuals survive. People are in need of psychological assistance, spiritual assistance. Professional psychiatrists and psychologists are saying that corporate depression, rates of suicide are increasing as we are, aren't as we are not able to to socialize with one another, that that natural desire to be around people is causing levels of anxiety to rise, suicide on the rise, drug addiction on the rise. People need the church in this time to help them survive. People are in need of spiritual help. What do we think? What do we feel when something happens on the media? How should I feel about it? What does the word of God say about that? This is not the time for phony preachers. This is not the time for preachers who are not prepared to bring prophetic words. So if the church is not in a position to help people survive, its doors do not need to be open. Now, why do I say that now? Because we're at a time right now that the only way our doors will stay open, that we can help people survive financially, feeding people, clothing people, leading people into the right directions to help them during these perilous times, counseling people, praying for people, being there for people. We're about to pivot hard and change our entire staff in a way that its whole trajectory and focus is on you, the people. The only way for that to happen is for consistent financial support of this place called Salem Bible Church. The word of the Lord says, bring all the tithe and offering into my house that there may that there may be meat in my storehouse. So if you're watching this, this is the time for you to participate like never before. This is the time for you to allow your tithe and your offering to be a priority. Never in our existence since 1891 has this church been need it as it is right now is any local church, any church that is doing something to help promote the survival of sons and daughters of God who may not be members, who may not even know the Lord. It's our time to do the work of the Lord. Now, time is not over. That's not going to happen until Christ returns. But it's time for us to not allow the perilousness of these times to mitigate our ability as the local church to do what we've been called to do. So like never before, I want you to participate in your giving on today. You can do that in one of several ways. Number one, you can mail in the tithe and the offering. Number two, you can go online and participate at SalemBibleChurch.org. You can give using the donate button based upon the platform that you're using. You can text your gifts. You can see the information right there on your screen. Or you can use the GiveLify app. You can go to the App Store, search GiveLify, download it to your Droid or your iOS, your Apple phone, and you'll be able to use it. A lot of people love it. It's very easy to navigate. But it's very, very important that you understand the urgency of your commitment in giving God the tithe and the offering. Not only those of you who are here locally in the city of Atlanta, but those of you who have been streaming with us live. Know your tithe and your offering is going to a church whereby their primary focus is in the survival of God's people, because that's where we are. Let's be real. We're not in a psychological uh, uh, state of of cushion and air conditioning, air conditioning and being in a season of abundance. This is about survival. This is about helping the people of God through the most difficult times that we've ever experienced. So your giving and your gifts on today and your gifts ongoingly will be integral parts of us doing what it is that we're supposed to do. 
Join us each Wednesday for our virtual Bible study. We have it every Wednesday at 12 o'clock noon, and you can see it at our, on our Facebook page, Salem Bible Ministries. Our virtual groups are growing every single week. There are people who are in need of community, people who are in need to be connected with other people, and we want you to be a part. We have great conversations and questions that are designed to help you grow as an individual. You can, you can become a part of one of those groups by going to SalemBibleChurch.org. Look at the 12 tribes groups. You submit your information and we'll get you placed uh, in the week to come. We look forward to that. All of our senior members, all of our individuals who have no access to Wi-Fi, you can listen and consume worship service every Monday morning at 10 a.m. If you dial in at 701-802-5291, you'll see the information right there on your screen. The access code is 713-1287. Now, to all of our elderly, we want you to know that we're working on something specifically for you. We're creating a ministry whereby it is designed to contact you ongoingly, to hear from your church, to hear from us, for us to check on you just to hear and to see how you're doing. I know these times are difficult for you. Your church knows and we understand, but we're doing something about it in order to keep it before you so you'll know how much we love you, how much we're praying for you, and how much we are standing in the gap for you during this time. So there'll be more to come very, very soon. Be a part of our mailing list, not email, but snail mail, old school mail. We're sending you a letter in the mail. If you want to be a part of this, you can register online at SalemBibleChurch.org. You can click on resources, forms, click on the inquiry form, fill out the information, and it'll add you to our list. We send letters to our people every four to six weeks. I want you to be a part of that. On our Stonecrest location, we have free COVID-19 testing. It's there every day, Monday through Friday, from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. You don't have to call in for an appointment. All you do is you show up. They're able to test you right there. The address is 5460 Hillendale Drive. Of course, that is our Stonecrest location. I want to thank all of you who've been a part of the 100 million steps for justice. We're taking steps for justice and we're giving for justice. Our church has raised more than four thousand dollars just about for this initiative. If you have not been a part of it, we want to be certain that you are a part of it. If you look at the information that's on the screen, you'll be able to go. Everything is transparent. All of the money that is raised will be going to one of five organizations. These organizations are organizations that are in the streets, in the highways and the byways doing the work to eradicate racism, to deal with social injustice, to deal with many of the things that we are in need of. Today in our state of Georgia, the bill has been passed. The legislation has been passed by the governor to initiate hate crimes in this particular state that protects people against hate crimes. We need that. It takes people who are lobbying. It takes money to fund the attorneys, to fund the initiatives for these things to happen. The dollars that are raised will be going to, to organizations like that that will help reform our government on every single level, the city, the state, and the federal government. We thank those of you who've been a part and we're asking for those of you to continue to be a part. Our social service ministry will be closed down on this week. We're open every Tuesday and Thursday. It'll be closed down. The food pantry will be closed this week at both the Baker Road and the Panola Road locations. It's going to reopen on Tuesday, July the 7th. The reason why this particular ministry and our ministry has been going on nonstop throughout this entire shutdown for the last three months. We have to restock. We've got to clean things. We have to bring things back up to code, reshelf, restock things so we can continue. This is just a comma. It puts us in a position to where we'll be able to better serve the community. So it's only going to be closed this week on Tuesday and Thursday. And again, it will reopen on July the 7th. All right. Until further notice, clothing donations will not be accepted at either campus. So you'll hear more about that when those things change. Again, we thank you for being a part of our worship service. We pray that it's helped you where you are. Feel free to share this, to tell other family members and friends about Salem Bible Church, the place of peace. Until next time, you be well, you be blessed. We'll see you on Wednesday for our virtual Bible study. We'll see you then. Peace. Shalom.
Shalom. May the peace of God be with you. Shalom as you come and as you go. May Shalom be your praise and song. A word to keep you strong. Shalom. Peace to you. Shalom. In everything you do. Salem. The house of Shalom. Shalom. May the peace of God be with you. Shalom as you come and as you go. May Shalom be a praise and song, a word to keep you strong. Shalom, peace to you. Shalom in everything you do. Salem, the house of Shalom.